All right, well, hey, we're all here and it's 5.03, so why wait? Yeah. Let's just dive right in. How many people are hoping for a day Me. off tomorrow? Oh, thank you so many of us. Anything news from this just morning? Just a little yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 We'll see. My, like usually yeah. I'm more pessimistic than my department chair is, yeah. but he was, he was actually on the... It's, it's so, morning. and the thing is where we are, we're more closer to the bubble that might yeah. actually get more of uh, something because they're saying like Northern Litchfield oh, County no. oh, yeah. and we're, you know, Burlington is in Hartford County, but Harmonton is in Litchfield County. So okay. we are right yeah. on that. Edge. And the elevation difference even between the, you know, the east end of Burlington and the west end of Harwinton is, is significant. Yeah. So we'll have days where it's, it's raining at Lake Garda Elementary yeah. And at Harrington Elementary, they're under a foot of snow. You know, it's like in yeah. in one district, we have that much difference from one side to the other. So. Them, right, and there's like two hills in Harrington that that shut down yeah. school for That's the whole how district. Wilton. 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 Wilton was really way more cautious than this guy. This guy I think this like, guy's going to be like, because we had the one day where every district around us had canceled, <laughs> and we were Farmington even canceled. Farmington, and we were the only canceled. district from, like, that what? just What's went it for it. And, She's so. from um, the place in upstate New York. Yeah. Buffalo. Buffalo. Oh yeah. I went to like, school I went to school in Rochester, so you do get a different from Buffalo. Yeah, they're like, ah, what's the you know Yeah, come on. This somebody is from Maine, Especially they're like, Yeah, we just three feet of snow, we just drive on top of it. Like, I remember as a kid we had like everything shut down. Oh yeah. Yeah. And those of us up here are laughing at Katie yeah. yeah. wasn't making you guys come in, was she? No, I think I'm, that's I mean, even Buffalo this time changed a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is All right. So, um, honestly, tonight, really the main focus is Powtoon, Powtoon, and more Powtoon. Um, I know last week it was one of those things I had looked at my watch and we still had 30, 40 minutes left, and I'm like, yeah, we're in great shape. And then I looked down the next time and it was, class was ending. I was like, oh, so I did. I know the end of class last week was a little bit rushed and I apologize for that, but we'll kind of get, you know, anything, any questions, anything that came up, I'll certainly be willing to go over tonight. Um, but if last week was about what the stuff is, just objects and characters and props and backgrounds and things like that, this week is mostly about what the stuff does. So we'll look a little more closely at the animations that are attached to a lot of the different elements in there, both props and characters and everything else. Um, we will look at uh, the A to B, which is essentially the way to, to actually animate characters and animate things on the screen. Um, so we're going to look at that. And then sort of the other timeline-based elements. So that's sound, and there's sort of three or four different tracks for sound in a, in a Powtoon. So we'll take a look at how you create and add those. And transitions are the other thing, but transitions are probably the easiest of all the stuff. So I'll save that for last um, because that really operates pretty much the same way that uh, transitions do in PowerPoint or anywhere else. So we should, by the end of tonight, really have kind of gotten through just about everything that Powtoon has to offer from the technical side. Here's all the things that it has and all the things it can do. And then from there on, it's it's really just a matter of practice and a matter of kind of getting used to using it and really thinking about your instructional design as you're using it. Um, but before we get into all of that, I did want to take a few minutes just to kind of debrief a little bit. Um, a lot of times when we have these forums where it's not a topic we really talked about in class, but it's something I want you to think about outside of class, I do try to take a moment in the following class just to kind of see what people thought, what your takeaways were. Um, the topic this week was about teaching facts. And I thought about finding some article or some whatever about teaching facts, but I, I thought it would be more interesting just to kind of see where your thoughts are. It, you know, being a teacher myself, I know that a lot of the focus in the last, say, 10 years has been on higher order thinking skills, on, you know, if you use the DOK system, you know, DOK 3 and DOK 4, and, and questions that get your students thinking and having to pull together different things and come up with original ideas. 
And, um, and facts kind of, we don't really talk much anymore about teaching facts. So um, I kind of wanted to start there. This coming week, there's going to be a parallel sort of thing, but it's going to be about teaching concepts. Um, so, you know, I read through the, the various forum posts, and there were a couple of things that seemed to kind of pop out at me multiple times. Um, but from your perspectives first, sort of what were your thoughts or your thinking about this idea of teaching facts? What are the challenges? Is it even important to do? What, if you want to share maybe even something you posted or? I, I, I'll start. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's really important. I think we've forgotten how important it is. Um, I, primarily, I've taught kindergarten my whole career, but I did three years of, uh, of third grade. And I remember those third grade students and getting the, new, the curriculum and everything was higher order thinking to be okay. But those kids came in with no prerequisite skills. They couldn't do the basic stuff that was the facts part because they're starting to worry about the BOK chart and, you know, kindergarten. And so, like, right now in the, my district, we don't have a writing curriculum. We don't teach any writing for kindergarten, none. All we do is whatever I come up with for a center or something. And so those kids, when they get to first grade, they're asked to write a story or write a paragraph. They can't do it. They don't have the, the basic factual knowledge of how to put a sentence together. The one when they get to fifth grade, we'll have oh, forget it. Seriously, some of the some of the standards that I put on my ID plan are from first first grade, and I told them that I'm like, this is a first grade skill, and they look at me like, what? I, I don't know. I don't know what a verb is. No, they don't. Yeah. They don't. Well, like, so what do you cover? What do you re what do you repeat from another grade? You know, what do you have, and where do you put it? Because they're not taking anything away. They're putting in SEL, right? Mm -hmm. Asking us to take time to get to the hard grades, which we can talk about when we start the big push. What's SEL? Social, social, social emotional, emotional learning. Social emotional learning. So take time to, to really have social open, emotional learning. Yeah, right. to have open conversations. And that just takes time. And this takes time. And, and it's not being, they're not taking anything away. So they're trying to figure out how to push it all in. No, and I think that it's just that as an education system, like teaching, I think we've been neglecting that as teachers forever, right? And asking people, like, if you, if you can't read, you can't read it. Like, this is part of the teaching. And it's just that whole expectation that they're trying to get everybody to do it drives me nuts. Like, math is very, it's school based and it's complicated. Yeah. You want them to, you know, I had a, and I had an evaluator tell me that. You really should have let them, you know, grapple, grapple with how to solve like an equation. And I looked at him and I said, I said, I know I should tell you that I will let them grapple with it here. I said, but I said, asking them guiding questions, hey, you know this course, what do you think we should do? I said, if they learn how to solve an equation incorrectly or they have this misinformation, that's going to trouble them for and if you can't solve an equation, is your math material going to be accurate? So it's the appropriateness of them to grapple. But learning the math is super important to do. I mean, what this is maybe a leading question, but what is the thing that Those has bad. what is the thing that has changed in the last yeah. 10, 20 so years? Attention spans. Attention spans. I can tell you, I have to do it in chunks. Yes, I'll do ten to fifteen minutes. Then we'll do a little something in the middle yeah. and questions and whatever. Yeah. Then another ten to fifteen minutes before it's on the period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I don't do that, I lose it. Yeah, and what's okay. the other thing? What's the other thing that's changed? Technology, and so and and their screen time it makes them they're they're used to so to stop all that and to look and focus on a teacher teaching for more than ten minutes, right. um, and then. I, I said in my thing that it's not just like, okay, so we've come a long way with since we've been oh, like still been all smart boards, the kids all have Chromebooks, but now it's gotten to where that's not even really making them interested. Like the interaction of something like Pear Deck or um, uh, Google Forms or something where they have to look how to, I don't know, something, something. It, like it keeps getting where they need, Kahoot, that's what I'm thinking. 
um, they, they need more and more to keep them entertained, mm -hmm. interested, and, and on task. And they need it there. Yeah. It's, well, it's oh. so like a system wide, like I agree with all that, but there's also this hyper competitiveness among students or among parents or about amongst districts that they always want to be the first and they want to be the best. And I guess yeah. I think that's always, <laughs> you know, I want my child to be in your advanced math. Yeah. Your child could be like in the advanced math. Yeah. Well, they need to be. And like that, and there's no, no way. I, I think, you know, they think that's a problem too. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. I think, you know, we used to be held back when we didn't do well. Now you're promoted no matter what. Mm -hmm. So even though you may not be reading at the right level, you may be two levels behind already, but everybody just keeps getting pushed forward. And I think, and I mean, we do have people that are interventionists, but um, even so, I. You know, I don't know if holding them back is the answer, but there's got to be something better than just pushing them along so by the time they get to fifth grade, they're on a third grade reading level and they're struggling just to they're be they're on the math track, but they're right. trying to hire a tutor so that they get into your class mm -hmm. in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. As you said, I don't think it's all the student, and I think a lot of it's what they value now yeah. is it's that you're supposed to do the higher level of thinking and they're just really not really ready for it. Yeah. And I think because we have so much knowledge at our fingertips, it's yeah. hard to deciding what is actually important. Right. And that's that's maybe the other thing I was I was trying to lead towards is some version of a student saying, Well, why do I need to memorize this? I can just look it up. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. right? And that's probably the other biggest change that's happened is we do have access to so many facts. But now, what's the challenge with that? Like, they're, they're not. Yeah, is it? And no Google they're, things they're are not finding, even realize that the answer doesn't make any sense. Like, right. The, like the first thing that pops two, up. Two different things. Two quite two different answers to the same question. Yeah. Right. They go to the first hit that comes up, right. and they say, "Oh, that must be the answer." And. Right. And so. we're also confusing with like Google Translate. When I was telling this to a teacher, I'm a native speaker, so when you Google Translate something and it doesn't make sense, I'll know. Right. You know, so, um, and they'll they'll try it, but then when it, they start getting the papers back from Udu or Zero or whatever, and they're like, "But but Google oh, Translate yeah, said yeah. it was right." Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, word here and there, fine. You know, but I try to get them away from because what what's been happening, I think, is that they go in and do all this, but when they go to take the IB exam, they have a piece of paper and yeah. you have a pencil, and that is it. There's no com there's no computer. You don't get a dictionary. So I do a lot of written stuff where they only submit to a dictionary. I actually have to teach where to find stuff in the dictionary. Like, I have a very I clear like, memory of maybe a third, when I was in third grade or something, going in class, going through exercises yes. where like, how fast can you find this word? And like, yeah, and you'd be like. The funniest thing is the hardest thing is teacher to listen to music because they, they say, I just absolutely love what it's convinced and has the perfect conjugation of the verbs, but we haven't touched them yet. And they mm -hmm. can't even refer to what they've been saying. Yeah. So I do a lot of written, like when I have them do written, it's in class, no computer. I'm mm -hmm. at the floor right now, I'm like, no, because they're going to yeah. look it up or whatever. No. Yeah. yeah. No, they got to be able to write well. And, you know. So, I mean, maybe one thing, you know, so the, the boredom, the attention span, all of that, maybe just kind of setting the stage for obviously what one of the main focuses of this class is, is that whole idea of gaming and gamification, all that. If one of the issues, one of the challenges we're facing is lack of engagement, lack of keeping their focus, can something like an animated video of something grab their interest in a way that just me telling them the fact wouldn't? Or coming up with some sort of a game-based activity, can that maybe help you know, because basically what I'm hearing, and I, I don't think you'd find many teachers who would say, oh, no, facts aren't important anymore. We really don't need to do that. I mean, that's that whole mindset, I think, is coming from somewhere, not from the people that are doing it. As, as, as you said, the pendulum used to be, you know, you think it's cool in the 1950s where you're just. Oh, yeah, everything was rote memorization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I think but it's, a, it's, one too far the it's a great way to know your times tables, you know, mm -hmm. and. and <laughs> yeah, so. Um, <laughs> 
So that might just be some, you know, a connection to make to that. That so the upshot yeah. of this is, you know, obviously if you're playing games, you're making games are more fact based than so the higher level of thinking. Well, or I mean, you can do any, but if if you're if an issue, you know, looking from the instructional design standpoint, if you've identified a problem, you know, they they don't know their math operations, they can't come up with the right vocabulary for something like that if it's if it is something fact-based and you're realizing that maybe the issue the the root problem after a needs assessment could be student motivation or student attention span or something like that if you're looking to solve issues of engagement of interest that these some of the tools we're doing in here might be ways not guaranteed because as you said you know you move the bar ahead in terms of entertainment value, and then that becomes the norm, and then they're no longer really interested in that, and then it's got to become the next, you know, you've got to keep pushing it. We were looking it. for transference. Right. Not just during the game, but when they start writing, they don't right. remember how to put whatever. Yeah, so, but, you know, it's as if, if Powtoon is a tool that's available, and you're realizing that you standing in front of the class and presenting a fact this way is just not connecting, but animating it maybe does somehow that that's a tool that maybe would help address if the core issue is one of engagement is one of of that kind of an issue you can certainly design games to teach facts to teach concepts to teach higher order thinking i mean some of the i have a nephew that was a real heavy gamer but he got into those ones where it seemed like it took two days just to set the game up by the time you got through all of the where all the pieces had to be in the cards and the this and the rules and and there's definitely some higher order thinking going on and strategy and, and all of that, but games can also be used or, or videos can be used at a very basic level also with, with facts. So, so yeah, any, I mean, I, it, it sounds like this is a topic we could probably rant on about all night. It's, I think I touched a bit of a sore spot. But, <laughs> but no, it is, it is true. It's, it's, you know, being a music teacher, a big piece of, or a part of what I do is a music literacy program that I started with all of our ensembles. So I'm doing the exact same thing with every student in every one of our ensembles. And at times I feel bad because it is very fact-based. It's just, this is a G clef. This right. is a quarter note. This is a, and yet if the students don't have that basic factual knowledge and they're sitting down in an ensemble and being told to play their instrument, and they don't know how long that note's supposed to last for. I mean, it's that's you know the equivalent of not knowing the word that they're trying to say or conjugate or something. So, you know, I I have these moments of feeling bad on the one hand because I'm only you know when it comes time to do the 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 um, curriculum documentation and they're asking you for the DOK levels and all. I'm going, this stuff is really just. Doke one or maybe two, I could make a case in some cases. It's basic recall stuff. But at the same time, they need it. like our ensembles have gotten better and the directors have told me that because now mm -hmm. they know that their kids know that this word means they're supposed to speed up. And if they know they're supposed to speed up, then they're ready for that and they can actually perform it correctly. So, um, you know, but explain that to an administrator who's going, well, how come they're doing all of this? Where's the higher order thinking skills? Well, did yeah. you go see their concert? Did you listen to the music they were creating? <laughs> well, and I think that's so. a helpful part is that, like, you know, there are definitely some lessons that are absolutely necessary that you have to teach, but you just, you know, you close your door and you hope the administrator doesn't happen to pop in those days because they will tell you it was horrible. But if you didn't do that lesson, two days later when you get to the higher order thinking, they wouldn't be able to, you know, do that. It's yeah. It's easier for the administrator to say that. You know, yeah, well, and that's where they're being pushed. I mean, if yeah, any if anybody's seen any of the O92 classes and stuff that you take, it's all, I mean, that's where everything is focused these days. And and watching what my department chair is going through right now, where they're, they have all these books they're supposed to be reading, and it's all about, one of them is called Brand Ed, and it's about you've got to figure out how to brand what you're teaching and I just want my kids to put on a concert and have fun doing it, you know, but that's, it is what it is, so. But that's a big part of it, too, is like you want your kids, you want the kids to have some level of fun, so they want to yeah. return and be engaged. And right, well, and, it, and being. It's always too hard if it's always a struggle. Yeah, yeah and being in the arts, 
we're yeah. looking at the future and saying, is it better for this student to get some experience now and enjoy it so that when they have kids in 10 or 15 or 20 years, they make that something that's important for their kids. And then that, you know, if you turn everyone off when they're in high school and they're all like, yeah, I played trumpet for two years. I hated it. I quit. And then that's the end of it. You know, where, where did the experience come? I mean, do you right. find that a problem in music? Is it, is it in general, or is it that students have more? Well, we we have that, and and I I don't know that we're worse or better than other subject areas, but because we're an elective area, yeah. you do have that issue of where's the balance point of requiring a certain amount of work out of the students that is measurable and does demonstrate growth and is kind of requiring them to work. But if you push that too far, then sure, a lot of kids are willing just to say, eh, I, I thought band was just going to be me I show up and play my trumpet. I didn't think we had to actually do work in it. And they'll right. drop. Well, then maybe there's people that just aren't good at it. I was not good at it. Yeah. I mean, I was very young, but the flute was way over my head. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Do I, do that. That. I, I I agree with her that <laughs> some people know. are really good at it and other people do it. Or do you think that is a cop out? Everybody has musical aptitude. Musical musical intelligence is one of the identified uh, multiple intelligences. Everybody does have musical aptitude. So as a music teacher, the goal <laughs> is to. <laughs> help every student achieve at least achieve their level of aptitude, if not overachieve their level of aptitude. So when people say, oh, I'm tone deaf, I can't sing a note, like that is patently not true. Um, so there is, everybody does have musical ability, just like everybody has mathematic ability. Everybody has linguistic ability. Um, granted, some people acquire their skills much faster and at a higher rate and achieve to a greater level. Um, but we are not allowed to say, oh, this student just doesn't have any musical ability, so they shouldn't be in our class. I know you're not allowed to say it, but do you think No, I, I believe it. I, I believe it. I have musical ability. Yeah. Okay. How about playing a trombone? Yeah. 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 One of my rock bands right now, they're seriously trying to figure out how to get a kazoo solo into one of their songs. I mean... I've got a girl who carries around a kazoo in her backpack every single day, every moment of the day, so that she can just pull it out at random times and play kazoo. So. Well, you have to have the skills to get it. <laughs> 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 she is so. love playing until he is scheduled. That's the hard thing about elections. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to take AP physics, and there's a double block. So yeah. it's like, that's the hard thing about it. Yeah, I mean, it's fun teaching electives because for the most part, the kids who are there are there because they want to be there as opposed to a class where they have to. Uh, but it also, well, that does happen sometimes. But mm -hmm. but the flip side is that we're elective. So mm -hmm. if we don't somehow keep our students engaged and keep them excited, then our programs dwindle. And then the administration goes, well, we don't need two music teachers anymore. We only need 1.5. And then yeah. the next time it's, well, we could really get by with one. So, all right, I'm getting off track, but but this is all great conversation and great discussion and all of that. So, um, so like I said, next week, and I'll get to this at the end of class, but uh, next week, sort of the focus, it's parallel of this, is going to be to focus on concepts. I do, in this case, have, a, have an article that kind of talks about one approach, particularly in a, through a, a lens of technology, for teaching concepts as opposed to facts. And um, there's going to be a little activity involved with that, along with with some some forum work. Um, but I'll go over that in more detail at the, at the end of class. So, all right. Um, anything else from previous week? I know some, several of you came in with some questions, and hopefully, I was able to help out with those questions. Um, Can you move the PowerPoint away? Unfortunately, no. Yeah, it's it's the one, you know, not the one thing, but it is a little annoying that they have to make their watermark so big and so yeah. prominent. It's it's yeah. It really might be the balance. Yeah. 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 You have to, if, if you've taken any of Dr. Bed's design classes, you have to just kind of 
block that part out and imagine that it's not there. Yeah, if we were a full commercial client, then they take that watermarking away. But any any EDU account, they keep that watermark there, even if it's a paid EDU account. So, but it's also a real easy way when you're on YouTube to see what videos are made on Powtoon. You guys see that little logo down there. All right, so uh, yeah, so this week, as I said, is sort of what the stuff does, and there's going to be several aspects to that. Um, so it it's, would be really useful if you're not already there to go ahead and get logged into Powtoon. Uh, if you've got a, a dummy project that you've been using just as a as a place to try things out, feel free to use that, or if not, start a new one. It's real easy to, to just create a slide or two and start dumping things in. Um, oh, actually, yeah, let me actually do this first. Before we open a project, let, let me address the submitting assignments thing. So uh, stop on your, I don't know what to call it, the splash screen, the home screen, where you can see all of your projects. Um, I know somebody brought this up last week, and I, I didn't want to say anything without me having a chance to look at it first, because Powtoon actually changed or added this feature uh, in terms of how students can share their projects uh, with, the, with the teacher. So um, what it used to have to do is there was a project, there was a thing of, of like uploading the project or sharing the project with the teacher and you kind of had to go through this inviting process and so on. Now what they've got, and I didn't know this until I saw you logged in last week because I obviously have a slightly different interface than you do, is that for each project you create, there's a, a little pull down menu now, and it, sh it probably by default says personal use. So you're looking for that thing that says personal use. If something is tagged as personal use, then you are the only one who can see it. So that's a way to keep something private. You don't, you know, you're just working on something just to test it out, and you don't really want anyone else to see it. So it defaults to that, so you're not by default sharing things with people until you're ready to share them. But because you're enrolled in my class, the other option you have is um, for this class. It's whatever the name of the class is, so it'll be like EDT 520 something something Miller D. Um, so all you have to do to submit an assignment when we have official assignments is simply change the status of the project to uh, the class. And then my interface on this end um, you won't see it yet because it's I loaded a while ago, but you'll see like one of my classes last year I've got this little tag telling me here. There's one new submission So if there are things that I have not had a chance to look at yet I haven't opened up yet. I do get a little indication here that hey five students have projects waiting for you And then once I've looked at them, they'll still show up for me But they'll they'll no longer sort of be hey you, you haven't looked at this yet so that's what happens at, at my end. If any of you down the road are actually using Powtoon as a teacher, um, this is the interface that you see is, is your groups, which are your classes, and then the students. And if I spring load that open, then it would show me who submitted things or who has things waiting for me to see. So the, the question a couple of you had coming in was, were we supposed to submit the little mini project from last week? And the answer was no, because I hadn't had a chance to show you how to submit. I wasn't going to require you to submit them. Um, but I would be interested in seeing what you did. So maybe just as A, a way to, to verify that you know how to submit those things, and B, just so that I have a chance to maybe glance at what you've done, um, go ahead and change whatever your, your mini project was from last week, your three slide fact thing. Just change the status to the class. Um, just so that we know we can do that. And actually, I'll, I will reload the page here. And that should mean that then I will get, see? Well, that the whole class can see them, or just... I think it's just me. My understanding is, is that, that that's just me. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you guys would know right now because other things would be showing up saying... Yeah, so, so like right now, I already have... Let's I'll reload it one more time here. So I've got seven new submissions already. So if, if I spring load this open, you know, I can see right off the bat. Um, if we did, if we added more stuff in our first try, would you rather do that instead? Because I, I probably did more work on the first one. Than I did um, just do the homework one. I mean, the, the other the other side of this assignment, which also a couple of people had questions about. Like, I had no I had no scoring rubric for this. This is not sort of an officially 
assessed graded project. Um, really, this was about giving you some sort of a focal point to try adding stuff into slides and how to. So the reason I connected it to teaching facts was so that you weren't just going into Powtoon with this wide open field of like, I don't even know what to put together. So by giving you a little bit of an instructional focus, um, I generally that seems to help people go, okay, well, I'm looking for this thing. Well, where is that thing? And then, you know, you're kind of have specific targets you're looking for as opposed to just kind of throwing the doors wide open and saying, just create a pretty picture. Because um, we could all do that uh, pretty easily. So. Um, so that, that process is simply what you would do. I think it's super easy and you can also, I believe, I don't know this for absolute sure, but I think you can then change the status back to personal only. And yeah, yeah. so like if you submit something and then you realize an hour later as we've all done, oh, oh crud, I forgot to, uh, and you have to go back and fix it. But the other thing is that, that sharing it with me doesn't mean it like locks it in. You can still keep on editing it, even if the status is shared with me. I will, when, whenever I open the project, I will simply see whatever the current state of that project is. Um, but if you want to, you know, if you've got a moment where you're like, okay, this is done now, I'm ready to turn it in, like just shift that status over, and then whenever I look at it. But for these, you know, I'll glance through these and I'll look for anything that's like glaring. But I'm not going to be going through this, this mini project. There will be another one for next week. They're really more about just having some practice using the tool as opposed to me going in and saying, oh, well, they were supposed to have this and this and this and this um, sort of a thing. So, all right. So now that we all know how to do that, um, we can go back and just open up a project. I'm going to start with a blank. Can I do one more question? Yeah. Do you have the middle where there are the three dots? One of the options there is collaborate. Does that really mean you can work, like, share it with somebody else in your class to collaborate? Like, I just, I didn't click on it. Does it work it together on the same Yeah, way? you can. What that does is it gives, uh, I believe it gives multiple people editing privileges for the project. But they can't work on it together at the same time. I, I doubt it. I've never tested it. I don't know. I know some... I mean, some things like Google Docs, you yeah. can literally have two people working on the same document yeah. at the same time. With something like this, my guess is is that if one person is actively editing it, it would be really hard to have two people doing that because you're talking about moving things around and changing animations. And if two people click on the same object and move it at the same time, like how does it know which yeah. one to, right. yeah. So my guess is is that collaboration would be kind of the the equivalent of sharing it with me, but sharing with people sort of at, at your level. If you... I, I'm just curious, it looks like it, like it sends a copy to whoever's email, so maybe, maybe oh, okay. it's just a copy. It's, it's possible. To be honest, I, I have not explored those features, so I will look up a little bit more about oh, them. You don't have to look it up. I just looked well, I, I mean, I should know I'm teaching it. Right now. <laughs> um, but yes. This. You can submit that way under more, too. For us, it says, mm -hmm. can I submit? I don't, I'm not yeah. sure, but it says that it's up there. Oh, maybe under the, the CCSU EDT, like the one that you oh, well, this tag. Yeah, I don't oh, there you go. Hmm. Okay, so something that I did not, I will look that up too. I don't know if maybe it's possible that maybe when you hit submit, then it does get locked in at that I point. Or? The thing I didn't I'll, I'll take a look at it, okay. see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I'm going to open up a blank Powtoon here. Now I'm up to Untitled 17 or something. And I don't know. I'm kind of in a cartoony mood tonight. I don't know why. So I'm going to pick cartoon. You can obviously pick whatever uh, look you feel like working in tonight. Um, so what things do? So several of the things that we looked at last week have some animation built in, as we saw. So I'm going to go with the obvious one, which is a character. Uh, heroes at work, sure. I just watched um, Civil War the other day. Um, I'm going to go with a sad firefighter. Okay. So um, obviously most of these characters have, wow, that was serious. We have tears. 
He has to wait for two. Well, not really much difference between the modern ideas and the uh, Yeah, I think it's just in the, the style of animation. Okay. So, anyways, uh, I was getting distracted by the fireman's tears. They're super dramatic. Um, so I did point out last week with these levels of animations with an object, um, when you go to, the, I call it the gear guy. So if I say gear guy, it's the little editing the things. There is an animation button there. And that really just has to do with whatever the, the looping animation is that the character does to express the emotion that you pick, whatever the pose is. And you really have three options. You can turn the animation off completely. So if you think it's distracting and you just want a still figure and they don't want it to do anything, you can just turn it all off. You can tell it to loop the animation a certain number of times. So maybe you just want them to wave once and then stop. Um, you can set that. If you select play in loop, then the, the motion will keep going and keep going and keep going until the slide is done or as long as the character is on the screen. Uh, so that's kind of one level of, of animation. And any object that is animated, that'll be the same thing. So a lot of the props, for example, have, let's see if I can find one here. A lot of the props will have animations involved too. Oh, let me go to specials because I know there's some down here. Um, I just saw one. Here we go. I'm going to add these, this box of chocolates that opens up. So same thing here. The box of chocolates has a little animation. And if I pick its animation thing, it's the same idea. I can have it animate. I can have it not animate. I can have it animate a certain number of times. All right. How can you tell what's, what's, what was animated? If, um, if there, it's an animated thing, I think as your mouse kind of drifts over it, it will, so like when I went over this stacked cake here, the stacked cake does a little sort of bounce up, but the cupcake next to it doesn't do anything. So it's it's kind of just going down through and seeing. Oh, so Got some it. of them will and some of them won't. Let's see if Cupid does. No, Cupid still. But this Cupid does. And that one shoots an arrow. I'm down in the specials category right now because I knew there were some things down here that had animation. Um, so it's kind of hit or miss. You just mm -hmm. look and see. Um, so yeah, so I, I did talk about that last week, but I, I know I was going a little fast towards the end of the class last week. So there are characters that have that type of animation. Props, some of the props. Some of the shapes even have animation too. So there's some of the certain shapes. I think there's like some stars and things that do little motions. Um, so, uh, you know, those are where you will find things that have that kind of looping animation. So that's kind of level one. Characters just staying in one place, but they are um, doing something while they're in that place. All right. Is that good? Okay. So everything else animation is going to relate to the timeline. And I really didn't talk about the timeline at all last week on purpose, because I really just wanted to focus on the stuff. But as you probably all noticed, across the bottom of your screen is this timeline. And this basically is the key to anything else that you want to have that's motion related on your slide. Um, from the start, you can make the slide, uh, the, the um, timeline longer and shorter. It's got a little plus and minus right at the very end. Uh, you can go up to 20 seconds. That's the longest that a slide can be in Powtoon. If you need to go longer than that, it'll actually give you a little warning and say, hey, if you want to go longer than that, you have to create another slide. And if you say yes, it'll create another slide for you. Um, and you can also subtract time. So if you, it, I think it defaults to 10 seconds, but if you only need two, you can shorten it down to two. The other probably most important thing in the timeline is the, is the playhead which is the little black triangle, because that, wherever that is, that is the current state that, you, that the slide will be showing, uh, shown to you. So as, if you want to manually, this is called scrubbing in the, in the uh, video world, if you manually scrub through the timeline back and forth, 
you can actually kind of preview and slow-mo what's happening when, so you can get a really good look at what's happening. So it's a way to, to move through your slide. Now, right now, if I drag my triangle all the way over to the left, there's nothing there. Anyone want to guess why? That was when you were talking about having something be out and come in. Good guess, but yeah, the the when I added those objects, my playhead was at a certain point in the timeline. And how did it get there? So that when when it, I think when you open a new slide, it automatically defaults to the okay. second number one. That's hard to say. The first second. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I added my character, it had the character start in the timeline at one second. And once I added that, it had automatically advanced my playhead by a half of a second. And when I added the hearts, that's where it put the hearts in. So the, the playhead is not just about moving through your slide to see it. It's also an editing tool. It's basically your cursor. So if you want something to come in at a particular point, the easiest way to do it is to put your playhead at that point. So if I drag it out to five seconds here and then add in this package, that package now will only appear starting at the fifth second of my project. I can change that. I'm not locked into that, but to avoid doing multiple steps, if you know where you want something to come in, move your playhead there, add that thing, and then it will automatically put that thing at that point. And it will make it last until the end of the slide by default. So it'll start it wherever the playhead is and move out. By the way, adding and subtracting seconds to your timeline also will happen from wherever your playhead is. And I've had some students get into trouble in the past because they went to shorten a slide and they didn't really kind of pay attention to where the playhead was, and they were essentially removing time from the middle of their timeline, and maybe accidentally actually removed an object because they got rid of the location in the timeline where that object appeared. So just as a warning, when you're adding or subtract, especially uh, subtracting seconds, but that's the other thing, the playhead, wherever it is, if I right now hit plus, it gives me a dark gray box right there saying, here's where I just added a second. And it even, when you're even drifted over the plus sign, it even gives you a little arrow right here at the playhead that's pointing to the right saying, I'm going to add the time starting right here. Is that really what you want to do? If you go subtract, then it's got the same thing. It's got the arrow sort of drawing back this way saying, we're going to be sucking everything back this direction. Is that really what you want to do? So if you wanted the object, what you're saying is if you want the object up there longer, you would make sure you click where the playhead is and add the time there. But if you wanted the whole slide longer, you would click the playhead toward the end. Yeah, I mean, generally, typically, one of the first things you address is how long you need your slide to last for. That's always the easiest thing to do because moving thing, you know, adding and removing seconds from a timeline is obviously a little problematic once you have stuff there. So it's easier. And if you're not really sure, err on the side of making the slide too long, because then you can always come to the end and, and just remove those extra seconds. But I mean, it's, it, it's all manageable at any time. I just want you to be aware that adding and subtracting seconds does, it does do it at specific places on the timeline. Okay, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not missing things as I go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Animation, we already covered that. Okay, so the next level of this is what they call effects, um, which is a little, well, it is similar to PowerPoint, but effects in Powtoon language are really, if an object is appearing or disappearing during a slide, if, it, if something's there the whole time, there's no effects. Effects are about the half a second as the thing appears and the half a second as the thing disappears. Powtoon automatically defaults to those timings. You can't change that. So you can't have something, you know, take two seconds to go through whatever its thing is. That is set. 
So I'm going to pick one of these objects. I'm going to pick my uh, presence here. I'm going to get the fireman out of the way. He's depressing me. When you click on an object now, you will see in the timeline that a dark blue bar appears. And that dark blue bar, that's a tongue twister, dark, dark blue bar shows you basically that object's piece of the timeline. So it gets, it's real easy for you to see, okay, this thing is established by the fifth second and then it's there all the way through the end. That blue bar will have a heavy black line on the right side and a heavy black line on the left side. If you want to adjust where an object comes in or goes out, you grab those black bars and that is what you grab and what you move. So if I want the package to disappear at the eighth second, I simply drag its black bar over to the second number eight. And then when I scrub through it, the package appears in the fifth second and it disappears in the eighth second. Same thing with when it appears, I grab that heavy black bar, I can move it. So here's where I said where your playhead is, that's where it'll add an object in, but you're not locked into that. If you want to adjust it later on, you can always move it around. The effect piece is the little triangular bit that's to, on the outsides of those two black lines. So if there is a triangular shaded area, then it means that it has added an effect for that half of a second that determines how this object appears. If you want to change that, you can go to locations. You can click right down in the timeline. There will be a little icon of what the effect is, and you can click on that. Or you can go back to the gear guy and go to the pane that says effects. Either way, it pulls up the exact same menu. It's just two different ways of getting to the same place. So either clicking on the little icon at the bottom or clicking on the gear guy and going to effects. Um, I, I think what is mostly here is mostly self-explanatory. There is an enter effect and there's an exit effect. How does it come in? How does it go away? You have the option for both of no effect so if you literally just want something to appear or disappear, um, sometimes you need to do that if you need to have something staying in one place and then a little while later it needs to move. The only way to do that is have one object there and then another object exactly like it comes in and starts moving. So in that case, you don't want any fade in or fade out. You just want one object to disappear and the other one to appear instantly. Uh, so you can do that. Pop means it kind of does a little boom sort of thing. Fade means it just fades in. It's got a bunch of different sliding effects from the four different directions. It can reveal something, which means that it, it comes in from on the screen, like it's coming from behind a hidden screen. Uh, so you've got your options there, both for enter and exit. Um, for some objects, it's not available for all. You can add a hand. Actually, I think that has to do more with the slide. Yeah, so if you're on one of the slide ones, you can add a hand. And that's where you've probably all seen it in videos where like the hand comes up and then pulls the thing away or slides the thing up and then the hand disappears. Um, so if you're using one of those slide uh, animations, yeah, it's only on the slides. It doesn't work for the reveals. So it's you, the yeah, the right, left, up, down, the slide effects. So you can add a hand and they give you four different choices there, two female hands and two male hands. I want to know how much money those people got for, to uh -huh. be hand models. Right. Like, we're going to put your hands in thousands of Powtoons. I want a million dollars. Um, and you also have some effects, some sound effects. Uh, these are just quick little things that will happen as the animation happens. A little pop, a little ding, a little whoosh, something along those lines. All right, so um, those are all options then. And that again is about how it enters and how it disappears. And your choice whether it does anything or does nothing um, is up to you. So now you can see my coming in is turned into a down arrow because that must have been the last thing I chose. So yeah, so now mine flies in from up above and then it just fades out at the end. Um, so those are our options there. All right.
Let's see. I want to, I do want to just give you some chance. I know you've all been clicking away. I want to give you just some chance without me talking. But let me, and let me get through one more because there's really just one more animation thing. Let me get through that and then I'll just give you some time to kind of push things around and just try it out and ask questions and so on. Um, so the last thing is A to B. And everything we've done so far, with the exception of it flying something in for you or flying something out, the object has basically stayed in one place. But as you've seen from other Powtoons, there are lots of times where things actually move around on the screen and actually do things. This is what the A to B function is. And almost every single object gives you an A to B option. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to take my packages here. Let me make a little room. Take my packages. I'm going to the gear guy. And I have the A to B option. When I click on that, what it looks like it's done is just copied and pasted my object onto the screen. There's now two of them out there. This is not a mistake. One of them is the A, and one of them is the B. So if I move them apart from each other a little bit, you'll see that they are connected. Gesundheit. They are, you, they are connected by a dotted line. It has an arrow on one end, so you know the A is the circle and then the arrowhead is the B. So what you are doing is saying the A is where I want the object to start, the B is where I want the object to end. If this was old Disney cell-based animation, you would have to then hand draw every frame from point A to point B and then you would play them all back. With computers, we have what's called tweening. And what this is, is I tell it the starting point and the ending point, and the computer calculates all of the points in between for me. So it's kind of nice, because now we don't have to think frame by frame. We can just think start here, end here, boom, do it. Now, in the timeline, We've now, on top of our regular dark blue box, I now have a darker blue box that's got the little A to B logo on it. So you can also adjust how long the A to B lasts for. What you cannot do is change when the move starts. By default and all for all time for Powtoon, these A to B moves will start from the moment that the object appears. So this is what I was saying a little while ago. If I want this package to sit there for a few seconds and then move, I have to fake it by putting the package there as a static object for the first four seconds, have it disappear, have it be replaced by the exact same one, and then move that one. Then it'll stay there for four seconds and then start its move. So it's the one thing I wish you could do. You can drag how the end of it. So you can have something move and then sit there. But you can't have something sit there and then move. Is that, did I explain that clearly okay. enough? All right. Um, so A to B. So right now, if I were to play this, my package is going to come in, and then it's going to start moving across the screen. And then once it gets there, it sits for a couple seconds and then it fades out gracefully. All right, so that's moving it. Can I have it move not in a straight line? Unfortunately not. That's another limitation of this. However, I'm not limited just to moving it. Any of my positioning or sizing or manipulation of this object, I can also include. So what if I want this package to get bigger as it moves across? I go to my B version and I simply resize it. Now, as my object moves across the screen, it's also growing. So you can resize things. You can also rotate them. So I could go to my B object and rotate it. And it does matter which direction you drag your rotation in, because that's the direction it'll follow. And you can't rotate past 359 degrees because then it, if you go to 360 degrees, it just thinks the thing is staying in one place. Um, I ran into this last year. I was trying to do a quick animation for a show I was doing, and I needed a clock, and I needed the hand on the clock to rotate around. And I kept trying to get it to go all the way around the whole circle, 
And every time I got all the way around the circle, it said, oh, it didn't go anywhere. I don't need to move it. So I had to move it almost all the way around and then just stop it short and so on. So now my package not only moves across the screen and grows, but it also tips upside down. I guess if I wanted to be clever, I could have it tip upside down and have the have the hearts come out of it. Ooh. Put the it. Yeah, <laughs> have the hearts drop on the fireman's head. So, so those kinds. So the rotation is just like you can rotate any standard object. There is oh, I lost it because I dragged it up on the top of my screen. But every object has that little um, curved arrow in one of the corners. If it's right side up, it'll be in your bottom right hand corner of the object. But if you've rotated it, it will rotate with it. But if you if you grab that and drag that, that's how you can rotate any object. Um, I think I mentioned this last week, but if you hold down the shift key while you rotate, it'll snap from zero to forty five to ninety. So if you if you are wanting to get something exactly rotated one hundred and eighty degrees, you can hold the shift key and then it just it snaps to those positions. Um, so any of that. So where it is, how big it is and how it's rotated, anything that you do to the A or to the B, it will then simply connect those two points with whatever motion needs to happen to get it from point A to point B. All right? So that's A to B. That's, that's the main, um, and I call that the actual animation. The other pose animations are nice, but they're just kind of localized. So this is where now you can really control when an object appears, how it appears, have it move around the screen, um, do things like that. If you need to, need to do the trick I was saying of having an object there and have it replaced, if you do a copy and then a paste right away, it'll paste the object right in the same place as the object you copied. And then you can adjust the timeline to have the one stay there and then disappear and the other one not be there and then appear. Okay. Yeah. Are you in terms of what they are? Like no. What what they do try to do, and it does, the more objects you get, the trickier it gets, especially if you have objects that all appear at the same time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take all three of my objects and have them all appear at the same time. When that's the case, and I know this is a little small, the little handle, the little um, I don't know what to call it, marker at the bottom. If nothing is selected, that marker will have a number on it. Right now that number is three, and that's telling me there are three objects that all appear at the same moment. If I'm trying to pick one of them and I don't want to click on it on the screen, if you click on that marker or hold over that marker, it'll spring up a little visual of those three objects. So if I want to pick my fireman, I can go to the fireman, click on him, it'll select that object and make that object off, uh, active in the timeline. So you can't add a word label or name objects, but at least it will show you if you've got multiple objects so you can be precise. The other thing I guess I should point out, and I know I did mention this last week too, but it was quick, is you can lock objects. The more complicated your scene gets, the more chances there are of you grabbing the wrong thing because a lot of these things have bigger boxes around them than just the object. So, you know, you go to move one thing and you realize you've grabbed the thing that was next to it and you've moved it instead and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to move that. So you can, if you know you've kind of got an object set and you don't want to accidentally move it, hit the lock on it and uh, that object then will become undraggable as you're moving other things around. Um, so that can be a handy little tool, especially if you get a lot of things going on the screen at the same time, so that you're not moving things that you don't want to move. Um, Did you say last week that if you put two objects, you know, close together, can you lock them together or group them? You, what I found is it does not have a, a, a full grouping feature where you can permanently say these three things should always function as one thing. It will always keep them separate. The best you can do is, I mean, you can, just like you can in just about anything, if you click on a thing, hold down the shift key, you can select multiple things. And then if you move any one of those, they'll, whoops, I didn't work that time. Oh, because I'm clicking on an AB thing. Um, oops, am I holding down the wrong?
Maybe it might be because uh, there we go. So it's the command key. Sorry, it's different shortcut keys. So if I hold the command key, now these two objects are selected at the same time. And if I do anything to them, it will move them both. But I can't permanently connect those two things to each other. Um, yeah, and I know that can be tricky too, because if you build a whole little group of things that you want to be able to have moved together. Um, I mean, you can also do the drag across multiple objects. I guess it's not letting me group that one because it's a moving object, but the non-moving ones I can select, you know, I can drag across them and it selects both of them and then I can treat them temporarily as if they were a group. But I did look into that because I think that did come up last week and there's not a, an official lock these two things together command. Is it possible to make the, um, uh, two things, two different things the yeah, I could have, like, I can take my fireman here, come on, fireman, and I could turn on his A to B, and maybe he's exiting stage left. So now my package shows up, and he shows up, and they're both in motion. So everything so. else below that um, line, nothing goes above it. Uh, I guess the, the timeline? Yeah, so everything's below. Yeah, all the little markers and everything will, will show below. I mean, this the the little pop-up will show up up above if it's got multiple objects it's got to show you. But yeah, the markers for each of the objects will appear below the timeline. They really reserve the space above the timeline for your for your playhead and for the and for the numbers. Um yeah, and then I mean, I, again, you probably figured this out, but if you drag your playhead to the beginning and hit the play button, then you will actually, in real time, get to see. That's gorgeous, beautiful animation. I have no idea what it means. So, but that's a way for you, you to use see. Am I using a lot, or is that like a yeah. bell and whistle? It's really use? content driven. It depends yeah. on what I'm trying to get across. I mean, having moving objects. I mean, that definitely will grab somebody's attention. Um, so if if I'm looking to draw attention to something, having it move, or you know Ken Burns, you all know who Ken Burns. Is. Ken Burns is a uh, does, documentary. does documentaries. He actually has an entire effect that is now named after him, because when he developed docu his documentary style, one of the techniques he would use is a still photograph, but they would video that photograph and slowly pan in or pan out on the photo or pan across the photo. That now has become known as the Ken Burns effect. So if I have something and I just want to make it a little more interesting on the screen, even just giving it a little bit of motion or maybe a little bit of growth can draw attention to that thing. So it can be a tool for doing that. I mean, if you're working with characters, then you might want to have characters like move into the frame and then start talking to each other or whatever. So there are lots of uses for it. I'm not saying it's going to be a requirement in every slide, probably not. Make it bigger, you just put what you just put them on top of each other. Make it bigger. Make like you're saying the Ken Burns effect, like where you're actually like panning out on it. Yeah, well, I mean, I could achieve that in here by bringing in an image, making the image, um, you know, putting it in not as a background because I can't animate backgrounds, but if I put it in as a, you know, as a shape or an image, then it's a an object just like any other object. And I could size that object to fill the screen, start. Okay. And then for the B, I could have it bigger than the screen. Okay. So essentially then that'll look like it's zooming in okay. a little bit. Or I could go the other direction. Or I could move the one image a little to the left and move the other one a little to the right. And then it'll basically pan across the image as it goes. So what I'll say is this. It is now just after 6. Um, and, and I do want to give you a chance without me jabbering away to just kind of try this stuff out and try to get it to not work and find out what, what the, the tricks are. So just, you know, play around with this for a little bit, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, something. Please ask questions if you've got them. And then uh, we'll address the, the sound issues and the transition issues, which will not nearly take as long as the animation stuff did because they're much more contained topics. Um, but yeah, just take take a little time on your own and just, you know, try to achieve, like if you have an idea in your head, see if you can achieve that idea. Um, or at the very least, just like I was doing, just randomly animate a bunch of stuff and see how crazy you can 
make things look 